Today, we're looking with Professor Hankula, uh, the author of this terrific book that I would really encourage everybody uh, to get a copy of. It's a really sweeping effort. Uh, in 200 pages, Professor Hakula looks at a whole host of issues and what the policy implications are, what the policy possibilities might be for the United States. And you've just seen up in the chat section uh, a link to that book, as well as a link to Professor uh, Hakula's website at the US China Institute site. This book begins with China's rise. That, of course, is a given. But what does that rise mean? And not just in one particular sector, not just, for example, in trade or in terms of environmental uh, protection or in terms of security, these kinds of things. Professor Hekula looks across, across the range of issues that the US and China deal with each other on. And he looks at the interplay among those issues because of course the US-China uh, relationship on trade doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not ever just about trade. But he also looks at useful places where we might focus our attention on finding common ground and not and separating those issues off from others in order to make progress. Now, this is an idea, of course, that has been put forward uh, recently by John Kerry and others with regard to climate change. Now, this book uh, is the product of tremendous research, and he introduces uh, us to core bits of work that have been done in these important areas as he explicates the ramifications therein. Professor Hekula has taught at USC for 35 years. Uh, he is a member of the faculty at the USC Price School for Public Policy, and he began as an economist, and his economist roots are very much in evidence in this book, but he's worked extensively extensively in development questions, uh, looking at development questions, as well as looking at urban planning. For many years, he headed the Price School's program for international engagement. And in that capacity, he was involved in a lot of different efforts, including special lab schools that the school ran in China and in other places. He's been involved in working with officials, in professional development and these other areas. Early in his career, he created an NGO, the Pacific Rim Council on Urban Development. And I think that that program is really remarkable in that every year or every couple of years, they staged a forum that brought together academics, officials, as well as members of the private sector to talk about developing or uh, addressing problems in a particular location. And these forums were held in Southeast Asia, in East Asia, uh, they began here in California. Now this book, uh, it deals with the realities of China's rise. It provides additional information on some sticky issues. So there are appendices about certain topics like what, how to compare carbon tax and cap and trade and that sort of thing. Uh, this is a great book for students, it's a great book for specialists, and it's a great book for, it's quite accessible for general readers. I would encourage you to get a copy of it. Now, Professor Hekula will begin with a 10, 15 minute uh, presentation that he has to give us an overview of the book, and then we'll go to questions and answers. There are really three distinct policy spheres. So the uh, one is the economic sphere, which deals with um, three, three sub areas. So, so one is fiscal policy and deficits. A second is uh, trade policy. And a third is employment and income. That's within the economic sphere. 
then there's a set of chapters that look at sustainability policy issues. And so that includes um, climate change. It includes urban policy because the nexus between climate um, sustainability and urban development is very strong. And it also includes energy policy. So those are the three chapters that fit under that sustainable broad sustainability sphere. And then there's a geopolitical uh, grouping of chapters that deals with uh, issues of homeland security, of defense policy, and uh, foreign, foreign relations. So those are packed together. Um, now maybe I'll, I'll, I'll move quickly to two, these two other slides just to expand on that. So what the book does is in a sense it, rather than thinking about China policy as a whole, it looks at these different dimensions, but then what it does is it pulls them back together. So in terms of the pulling them apart, um, this, is, this graphic is in a sense representative of those three broad clusters that I just spoke about. The economic grouping represented here by GDP, uh, a, a sustainability grouping represented here by carbon dioxide emissions, and a uh, geopolitical group represented here by defense expenditures. And the key takeaway here is that what the China rise of China represents to a US policy perspective depends very much about which policy sphere we're addressing. I mean, just visually, you can see these are, these are popping out in, in very different ways. And I don't think we need to go into the, you know, the details of each right here, except to say that, that this kind of emphasizes the point that you know, where I stand with respect to the rise of China depends upon where I sit in terms of what seat of authority I might have in terms of policy making, either in the federal government or uh, indeed elsewhere, likewise would hold through, through state governments, et cetera. But how, what the rise of China represents to us in a policy sphere really depends on what our policy sphere is. So that's the kind of pulling things apart. Then the pulling, pushing things back together. These are the nine groups. So the green represents green for money, right? So this is, these are the kind of economic linkages, the fiscal policy and deficits, the trade policy, employment and income. The blue represents blue skies, blue water is, is sustainability. So we have environmental policy, uh, the, this climate change, really the uh, energy policy and urban. And then the red for red alert represents uh, the geopolitical sphere, policy spheres. And that looks at homeland security, defense and foreign relations. So the diagram I showed you just a moment ago is really in the opening chapter, uh, kind of saying that this, you know, the, making that point, we're gonna be looking at these different domains. This diagram appears in the closing chapter, chapter 11, uh, which, which looks to pull things back together. It says, all right, we've looked at all these different elements, but we're not gonna just leave them on the table as sort of anatomical objects. We, we need to think about how they, how, they, how they pull back together and how they relate to each other. And I think this is one that's worth making you know, a few uh, important observations about. Um, one is I've made the thickness. Now this is all notional, but it's notional after having spent years <laughs> writing on this topic and researching on this topic. So it's called, let's think of it as an informed notional uh, perspective on how these elements fit together. The thickness of these arrows. So the, the arrows, of course, the direction indicates uh, kind of how one policy sphere impacts others, but the, so that's kind of the directionality. And in some cases we see there's a bi-directional uh, impact. Um, but the thickness of these uh, vectors represents also the strength, the magnitude of these impacts. And you can see from this diagram 
that trade is really stands out in an important way um, that it's a kind of locus for many of the other economic policy spheres. Uh, fiscal policy and, and deficits are related to trade policy and employment and income is related to trade policy and uh, vice versa. And of course, trade policy in turn feeds into foreign relations. Uh, so, so that's sort of one dominant uh, sort of lineage, sort of policy lineage to take note of. The other has to do with the role of defense. We can see very strong lines of influence between homeland security and defense with foreign relations. And that represents the fact that trade, homeland security and defense, all of these are in it, intrinsically interactive policy domains. Trade by its very nature has us interacting with other countries around the world, including especially China. Homeland security, by its very nature, intrinsically has us interacting with other, other countries around the world. Defense intrinsically has us engaged with, or at least keeping a wary eye on other countries in the world, and hopefully not being too engaged with them, right? And so that's not surprising in retrospect to see those, those strong lines there. And again, homeland security, for example, influences trade policy. If we think about Huawei, for example. We think about well, what kind of trade do we want to allow, and what are the homeland, what are the security implications of that? Uh, by the way, pandemic, and this was a chapter I was writing before the pandemic hit. But we were, I was looking at issues such as um, the pandemic that falls within the domain of homeland security, because some of you may be wondering about that, because that's on all our minds now. The other is the role of energy. It, it occurred to me early in this that energy plays a kind of linchpin role in that it, um, it feeds in in many ways to others, but in particular, energy feeds, of course, into urban and uh, that, that environment. It says environment, but actually that should say climate change. And this dotted line is one that I think is very significant because as I was finishing up the book, as I was putting this diagram together, it struck me that there was this missing line, that there are strong links on the economic side and on the geopolitical side back to foreign relations, but there were no strong links from the uh, sustainability side back to foreign relations. And I felt that climate change offered the best opportunity for doing so. So seeing what's happened just this year now with having a former Secretary of State, John Kerry, now taking on the, this principal responsibility for in effect making this dotted line a much more solid uh, line uh, is in my view, a very, very positive development. So that's sort of how these things, how these various policy spheres f pull apart and how they're pulled back together. Just in terms of what are some of the main takeaways, um, I wanna emphasize, this is about policy analysis. Uh, the other thing I tell my students is that this is not about China per se. This, this work is really about how the rise of China influences the context in which policy issues that we're gonna be grappling with whether or not China is rising those policy issues are, are the focus of the federal government and all the different departments. They, those departments didn't just arise because of China, but it's, it's the rise of China reshapes this. So I like to use the metaphor of how the moon affects the tides. Even if we're not looking to make a trip to the moon, we wanna be conscious of how, if, if what we're really doing is getting in a canoe and looking to uh, canoe around the a Delta or estuary, uh, say the Pearl River Delta, you'd be well advised to think about how the, how the rising moon is influencing the tides and how that affects 
the way you set your course of action here on earth. And so I, I think that metaphor applies very well for, for what this book is trying to accomplish. China is that rising moon and, and we're thinking about how to navigate our own policy domain, recognizing that the world and the context in which policy is formed is being reshaped and how do we recalibrate that? I'll just give a very simple example of that, a very succinct one, I think, is the rise of China in the context of climate change. The rise of China can be summarized or its implications can be summarized most succinctly by saying it, if it increases the social cost of carbon. And that's a very simple statement, but in, in my view, it has profound implications. Um, another thing I wanna do is just take my hat off to the um, CRS reports. Uh, I had thought well of the Congressional Research Service before I undertook this project, but I hadn't, quite frankly, I hadn't thought about them that much. But when I undertook this project, this writing project, increasingly I realized what a valuable job they do in laying out uh, a very kind of neutral but analytically rigorous uh, representation of what these policy issues are across the board. And as I got further and further into this work, the more I began to admire the work that they do. So I just wanted to uh, salute them. Um, the other thing that I think is a, an important takeaway is that um, while you know there's a lot of uh, heat and debate about the role of China, uh, in the US context. Fortunately, in the last several months, that's died down a little bit. Uh, but one thing that is very important to us for us to remember is that there are a number of goods that are very important to us that these are global public goods. And the most obvious is environmental quality, climate, uh, you know, the, the climate, global climate. That is a global public good in the, in the sort of technical sense of the term that economists use. And there are other examples, even these institutions like the WTO, whether we think of it as a, you know, uh, regardless of what we think of how well some of these multilateral institutions are performing, from a technical analytical point of view, they are global public goods. And the role of China in helping to determine the shaping and the support of these kinds of global public goods is very critical. And, and, it's, and club theory is a kind of an extension of that. Um, a, a kind of a related point is what I, this World Order 2.0. The, the fact is not every country out in the world looks like the US and has the same aspirations as the US and has the same values as the US and has the same uh, level of economic development and has the same political institutions, et cetera. And so what might make sense for a US context and what might make sense for a US aspirational context does not necessarily apply to others, including to China. And so I, I think we are not serving our own interests well if we go about bashing China because they're not like us. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the world out there uh, can relate to uh, some of the issues that China is grappling with in, in terms of its stage of development and many others. And so there's a useful role for the US and China if there's gonna be a world order 2.0 that works broadly, both for US and China and other countries, it must start with US and China coming to some kind of mutual understanding of what that might look like. And so it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. Finally, uh, I think one of the things that I've learned by undertaking this project is the importance of, for us, of our having our own house in order. And it, you know, a, 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 an example of this, I think, is very, um, 
very pressing is that of trade deficits and fiscal deficits. Uh, as explained in the book in, you know, in, in fair detail, uh, there, there is an intrinsic link, right? That if the US government, if we at home are running enormous fiscal deficits, the likelihood and almost the inevitability of us running trade deficits is very strong. And that linkage is, it's not just a coincidental thing. There's a causal linkage, which is explained in fairly you know, clear technical way, I think, uh, I'd like to think in that, in, in that book and in the appendix. So that's an example of where we are actually doing ourselves a disservice by pointing the finger at others, whether it's China or elsewhere in the world. And those, those people who keep trading goods with us, uh, we've got to look at what we're doing ourselves. We've got to take responsibility for ourselves. And that's the nature of democracy. And that's you know, both the good news and the bad news is that in, in a democracy, ultimately, it's not the political leaders or those people out there who take responsibility. It's us. We are responsible for our destiny. And that the implication of that is that we need to understand things. We need to take a good look at them. We need to understand what really, uh, how these things really hang together. And so this project is one small step in that direction. Thank you very much uh, for that overview of this very rich book. As uh, may be evident, uh, there's coverage here of virtually everything. Uh, trade, of course, one of the central issues through climate, through environmental cooperation in those kinds of areas, all the way through foreign relations, defense, and these sorts of things. Uh, there's a chapter or a sub chapter for everybody. Um, you know, we have, for example, the pandemic uh, addressed in a sub chapter about uh, China going viral and things like that. So uh, definitely. Uh, there's much here to look at. And I want to take you through each of the big three parts of the book, the way that you've organized that. But before we do that, let me go to the moon. Uh, you use that metaphor uh, in the book. You've brought it, uh, brought it to us just now. And you talk about needing to understand the moon if you're going to be able to anticipate the tides and uh, be able to manage your own uh, kayak or canoe trip uh, effectively. And you compare that to China's rise. China's rise has impact throughout life. Uh, so there's really no aspect that isn't in some way touched by that. And that's all absolutely, absolutely true and well articulated in the book and also in your presentation. Uh, but we don't try to change the moon. <laughs> right. And we don't uh, we don't think that our uh, how what we do with our kayak will somehow affect the movement of the moon. And so I was wondering if you could talk uh, briefly about this. Uh, I, I know I'm taking you a little bit away from the focus on getting your own house in order. And this is a book about U.S. policy. But some of U.S. policy and some of the things that you talk about in this book, or how do you create an environment uh, wherein it becomes in the interest of China to act in a way that also works for the United States? And so maybe you could talk about that, uh, that push-pull. That's actually a very important question. Actually, it's the first time that's been posed to me in, you know, in that way. So I, I like the question very much. I think the, um, the key thing for me is um, sort of the nature of our engagement with China. I think by, by focusing on ourselves, we develop more clarity and we can uh, speak with China uh, with more, in a sense, self-assurance, more justified <laughs> self-assurance about, look, this is what we can do and this is what we cannot do, right? This is, 
with respect to climate change. This is where we can meet you halfway. This is where we cannot. With respect to homeland security, this is what we can allow. This is what we cannot allow. And and this is why. And you know, have a kind of a. And the more the the stronger consensus we have here at home about what we can do and what we cannot do, and uh, that uh, clarity on both sides, I think, helps both sides. The 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 other part of it is that I think. Um, my own experience, not at the not at the level of sort of diplomatic ties, but uh, you know, I've, I've spent I, I must have made fifty visits to China in the last you know thirty years, um, and doing a lot of you know sort of engagement. And funny as it sounds, I actually find that my interactions with Chinese I find to be very American like once you get down to it. Right, there's a little bit more of the kind of formality at the front end, which I actually like, you know, and you know, just in terms of you know this and this, you know, and 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 kind of the courtesies. But once you kind of have those taken care of, I find they tend, in my experience, they speak very frankly, and in my experience, it's been very good in terms of follow through. That, and I know that that's not everyone's experience and, and whatnot, but I think that um, we have a better chance of, of um, finding common, common ground if, if, we, if we engage with them in a kind of the best way that Americans can engage. And I say this as a native Canadian, right? So when I praise Americans, I like to do so as a Canadian, right? Um, and, I think that is one of the virtues of Americans is that there is a kind of straightforwardness and and kind of saying saying things as as they are, and and as I say, I don't think that's as alien to a sort of Chinese culturality, at least in my experience, as one might think, right? Whereas other places, I do find you know it just doesn't work, you know, and you have to find some other some other way. But another important part of this is that. I mean, if we're going to sort of change the moon, taking shots at the moon, <laughs> gratuitous shots at the moon is just not the way to do it, right? It's it's harming our own self-interest, right? So, so uh, I think that the level of China bashing and it's been toned down considerably the last several months, uh, but some years prior to that, um, I, I found it terrible to see the sort of gratuitous, you know, sort of going out of our way to uh, vilify China. And then to think that we're going to sit down with them and try to work out reasonable arrangements about areas where in fact, there are areas for mutual accord. And I'm optimistic that they're willing to operate on those areas and they're gonna be tough on areas where there are not areas of mutual accord, but let's not throw away things we don't need to. So that's that's my general view on that. Now, thank you for that. And uh, at several points in the book, you mention, look, this is an area where we are going to be both rivals and collaborators. And you're very explicit about some of those things. And as I read the book, uh, this is in many ways a manual about how the American government uh, is organized and how it approaches different, uh, different kinds of things. And so it focuses on trying to get right what is, if it's within your grasp. And so your focus is not about the politics. Uh, right. You do touch on the politics of these issues, but your focus is on the policy. And as you highlight repeatedly, you're trying to be dispassionate. You're trying to look at the substance. Uh, you know, what does the data tell us about this particular question? And so that comes through from the first page very much to the last, is that technocratic sort of, let's, let's unpack this. Uh, let's see 
you know, what what seems to matter here for the United States, who does it matter for, and what can be done about it. So it's very much a book that, as it says, from a U.S. policy perspective. And so we've got uh, some questions in the Q&A section already about, well, what does China want? Uh, what are China's ambitions and things like that? But before we go there, before we go there, let's begin, as you do, with economics. And you cite the work of several scholars that illustrates that trade uh, you know, has benefits and it has costs, but that those costs may be very localized, whereas the benefits are very diffuse. And can you explain what that means? Sure. Yeah, and I and I think it's I, I do think it's an important point that, that you that you pick out that um, and and actually there are they're cited in the book and so I won't try to remember all of them but there are some very good studies out there that have looked at the, um, the these these impacts of trade on employment and the way I would characterize the findings is exactly what, what you've just said. They tend to be fairly localized and they tend to be, they, they tend to impact most heavily on uh, poor skilled, lower skilled labor in the US engaged in the production of manufactured goods that can be sent broadly, that can be done at scale. Uh, one of the authors whom I cite mentions the very important point that if, if, if it's producing something that can be, if, if it's a manufactured good that can be produced and then distributed globally, it almost doesn't matter where they're situated. And so, uh, you know, the US, we don't want to play a race to the bottom, right? What we want to do is keep, you know, um, looking at labor, ultimately productivity is the key. <laughs> to economic output. You know, you just can't get around that. I mean, one reason I actually went to pursue an, a PhD in economics ages ago was so that I could finally convince myself you don't need a PhD in economics to sit down and make sense of some things if you're just willing to look at them. And that's this is a prime example, right? You, you, you don't need a PhD in economics to know that productivity is the key. So what are the things that we can do to enhance productivity within the country and going out of our way to defend low productivity jobs is probably not the longer run solution. And so instead, I think finding you, way- before, please. Sorry for the interruption, but why not? Why not? Why is uh, the defense of you know, maybe the lower skilled, lower value added task uh, not worth doing. It's not that it's not worth doing, but it's not priority. And it's not going to be the most efficient way to enhance productivity. So we're looking at productivity in the aggregate, but the, the key, and this is another fundamental uh, issue that's raised in that same discussion, is is that of inequality mm -hmm. yeah so if we if we start on the we need to improve equality side of it um it it actually will find its way back to the same you know so there's no intrinsic conflict between and enhancing labor productivity and improving uh equality economic equality so a lot of it has to do with uh, really the way we take care of our own here at home, right? But the answer to your specific question, why not? The, the basic answer is because ultimately, if I'm in a low, if I'm in a low productivity job, but it's all I've got. I want it protected, and I want you know I'm I, I'm I, I'm looking at anybody who can help keep me you know safe in my low productivity job. I'm not thinking about whether it's high productivity or low productivity. I'm thinking this is my income, right? But you know the fact is ultimately it's 
it's productivity that's going to get us there. So if 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 you're if you're able to find a way to help me move from this low productivity enterprise to something where I'm actually going to be contributing more, and you and we do that across the board systematically and carefully, but also taking care to do it in a way that we're not leaving people sort of, well, sorry, you're low productivity, you're you know, off you go. Uh, so I think th there's a question of um, strong moves to enhance uh, productivity improvements while at the same time engaging in social safety nets that make sure that we're not just discarding our own, that ultimately it's a human thing, right? Yes, it's economics and yes, these numbers add up, but it's you and me and the next person uh, and our families and our sense of ourselves. And you know, so I, I think we can do a better job of saying, well, we want everyone to contribute and the nature of your reward may in fact be tied to the nature of the contribution. And certainly in the aggregate, the nature of the how well we're doing economically is gonna depend upon our productivity, but we're gonna find a way to do it together but in a dynamic way, forward looking and not hanging on to low productivity activity, uh, low productivity activities that in the, just aren't gonna add up in the, in the aggregate or in the long run. And in the book, uh, you make this point very, very well. Uh, you say that, you know, increasing productivity, uh, you know, for all maybe small consolation if it is your job that disappears, yeah. uh, having access to cheaper goods, uh, same quality, but cheaper goods, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't necessarily, you know, solve your problem. And so when you're talking about this social uh, safety net, uh, you do talk about training programs and things like that. And I was wondering if you could say just a little bit more about those policy implications because we have seen manufacturing employment fall dramatically, yet manufacturing output, the value of manufacturing output has risen uh, to unparalleled heights. Labor productivity has risen there as well. Yes, you're right. And well, you talk about uh, the, the job retraining because this is one thing I learned actually from the research on this. And again, I credit other authors and I can't remember everybody who's, whom I'm citing, but. Uh, that's why I wrote it all down, right? Uh, but there's a wonderful, very detailed, very thorough study that that underpins part of that that discussion um, about the the training, and they they do a very impressive job, and they've su surprised me. the The bottom line is the training is is not actually the key. You know, what they did, they look at people who are being trained. So they had group, they, they looked at people who lost their jobs, you know, due to this kind of competitive environment. And uh, some of these people were put into retraining programs and others called a control group were not. They were in a sense left to find their own way. And by doing a very careful statistical comparison over time, looking at the training group versus the control group, the finding was that the control group did just as well as the training group. Yes, the training group did well, but so did those who received no training. And that's actually good news because what it tells us is that our economy actually has some pretty strong rejuvenative qualities. And we don't wanna, we, we, we like that, right? That's, that's something that's, that's very good. But another important point that comes up in this context is that we talked about these effect impacts being localized, but they're localized in community. So it's not just you or me or your family and my family, it's our community is being hit. And of course that plays out in the politics. We've seen presidential politics and everything. So much of the, of the, of the campaigning is focused in some of these you know, specific localities. So, they're very sort of highly charged and emotive issues and, and a lot of the way that they're treated by press and by the polit political leaders themselves exacerbates that. But, the, but the, one of the key 
that I think is very important for us to think about, and this is the link back to urban policy, is that the, the rejuvenation I talked about, the fact that our economy has this rejuvenative capacity, sometimes it may be that it means that we have to leave our place, you know, the place where maybe our grandparents lived and our great grandparents lived and where our kids go to school and where we have attachments. And yes, I could get a job by moving to some other state that appears to be booming, but then I'm leaving behind my social network, um, you know, and, and these things are real and they're, they're, they, they, we, we don't really have a way of keeping track of those in economic terms. But in the urban planning domain, this is a topic that, that is very meaningful. It's, it's, it has to do with place. And it's not just a, it's not just a meaning, you know, an empty tableau upon which you are setting activities. It's it's a place. It's a place that we're attached to, in term, in our hearts, right? And and these are our lives. These are our people. This is our home. This is my river. This is the, these are my mountains. And and I I want to make it here. I want to I, I want to stay here, and I want to thrive. And so community building, uh, place building is important. And I think getting urban planners to work uh, more alongside uh, urban economists and vice versa, because as someone who's, who's, who works in both fields uh, quite a lot, uh, I find that there's a, almost a kind of a communicative divide. You know, I have to speak economics to one group, I have to speak urban planning to another group. But I think that uh, more um, integrated approach to thinking about how we build communities and make them thrive would be very uh, well advised here as well. Well, it, thank you for that. And this book uh, goes into questions about, uh, you know, the extent to which the United States uh, is dependent on China as a lender. And you talk about the long uh, tradition going back to Alexander Hamilton, of using debt productively and that sort of thing. And you highlight the idea that China's $1 trillion uh, you know, holding of American treasury notes uh, represents a big bet on the success of the United States, mm -hmm. uh, the American government's ability to continue to pay interest on that debt. So you highlight that, you take us through uh, the currency manipulation question, all of these different kinds of things. But I want to uh, come back to something you just said about labor mobility mm. and you know, trying to foster that perhaps by making health insurance more portable, by doing a whole host of things involving you know, urban planning as you highlighted. But several people in the Q&A section have raised questions about the role of American universities mm -hmm. and uh, the openness of American universities to students from China, to visiting scholars from China, that sort of thing. And uh, earlier this week, the Biden administration announced uh, a return to a more open door policy so that students will be able to get visas, will be able to come from China and from elsewhere to the United States and bring their energy, bring their creativity, bring their smarts, and while learning here, also perhaps contributing uh, to the development here. Several people in the in the Q and A have raised the question. Your your World Bank uh, colleague Tom Zierley raises the question of: Are American schools still the gold standard? And others have raised the question about whether or not American universities working with Chinese universities represents a sellout on human rights. That because some of the things that the Chinese government does uh, you know, are so detrimental to the rights of entire peoples that maybe this kind of collaboration should stop. I don't see that as as a uh, a positive way forward, and that's not to uh, to de-emphasize the importance of human rights. Uh, but again, I would come back to 
making our, I think one of the strongest statements we can make is demonstrating here at home uh, how much we value human rights, how much we, uh, how we hold these values true. Simply saying we do and hectoring others whom we believe are not performing well in that area. Uh, and even if there's strong evidence that that is indeed the case, doesn't enhance our own moral standing, which ultimately, I think, puts us in a better position to talk in a way that others will listen uh, in, a, in a different way, but also will strengthen our working with allies. You know, I think one of, one of the takeaway messages for me as a, you know, when I came to the end of this, this writing project was I, I realized how many times it's the case that really we need friends in the world. It's, um, we can't do it alone, right? And most countries are that way, right? I'm, I'm Canadian originally. So you know, when you're from most countries in the world, you sort of understand you don't wanna be just out there in the cold naked on your own, right? You wanna have friends, right? Um, and the fact is, that's true here in the US, but specifically with respect to the question of the universities. I mean, we're here we are, you know, at a university, many of the folks who are joining us are from universities. But again, as a Canadian, one of the things that I value most about the United States, and I say this as a Canadian, is the incredibly dynamic strong universities throughout the country. I mean, it's just a marvel. And there are great universities elsewhere in Canada, in, in China, in, 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 you know, throughout the world. But the United States, I mean, you know, I, I've lived in sort of academic life, you know, al almost, you know, forever, right? And the US is a special case. And again, I say that as a Canadian. And the other thing that I find is, and I say this as an American, one of the great benefits of being at a university here in the United States is that I can, all the times I sit, you know, say if I'm on a dissertation committee, thesis, dissertation committee, and we may have a student from country A, and then a faculty member, you know, one faculty member from Canada, another from India, another from China, another from the United States, another from, from Latin America, sitting around the table, um, focusing on an issue. And so the world is brought to us in not sort of served to us, but it's more that we are able to sit here in the United States and the universities are not the only place, but it's one of the best places I can think of to, to engage with the world right here at home and in a very meaningful way. And there's all kind of potential for follow-up. So yes, there are things that are going on in China that we may have very serious concerns about, but to say we're gonna close off university channels I think it would be shooting ourselves in the foot. Well, and again, uh, the students who come are exposed to that different operating system uh, that you make reference to in the book. So they have an opportunity to see what an open society is, how a democratic society functions. And so through that, uh, you, can have, you can have some influence. Also on the economic side, um, you know, something like a quarter of the people who teach the science of artificial intelligence in American schools. So roughly a fourth of those who are now preparing the next generation of these AI specialists, uh, they took their undergraduate degrees in China and then came to the United States for advanced study and have remained. And so that is part of that continuing productivity revolution that you were talking about. And AI also represents 
a giant threat to jobs in the United States and in China. And one of the things uh, you don't uh, fully address it in the book because of publication schedules, but we we have the news that China's population for the first time in a very long time since the famine of uh, the late 1950s, early 1960s did not grow. And what that might mean, a shrinking labor force, all of the potential ramifications on that front. I wanted to stick with one of the points that you just made about friends. Mm -hmm. And you can have friends that are, you know, all weather friends, no matter what the situation is, they will be with you. And then you can have partners in specific ventures. And climate change might be that category. Mm -hmm. And you devote a lot of space in your book to discussing the role of a G2. That's not to dismiss Europe. It's not to dismiss Japan. It's not to dismiss the rest of the world. But as you said, say so very clearly, that these are the big emitters. And these are the countries also with the biggest economies. So they have the greatest responsibility. What kinds, what, what are the policy priorities here? What must be considered if we are to address this pressing crisis? Are you talking specifically about climate change? Specifically about climate change. You raised the question of G2 in other spaces, such as yeah, right. you know, giving, giving new birth to some kind of trade organization and things like that, but specifically with regard to climate. With regard to climate change, actually, as I mentioned, um, you know, in, in passing in my op some of my opening comments, um, I think from an economist's way of thinking, uh, as I mentioned, the the rise of China and of India and and you know so much of the rest of the world, the implication of that is that it raises the social cost of of carbon, and w w to to understand that we can go backwards from sort of understanding the nature of climate change. One is it's a global phenomenon. So whether you're emitting over there or I'm emitting over here, these carbon emissions have a, their global, the impact is a global phenomenon. So it doesn't matter what the source is and where the source is, it, it what matters only is the total. And so, again, from an economic perspective, this is a this is a poses a free rider problem because what happened is the total is bad. Having a large total of these carbon emissions is bad, uh, and I, I, from my point of view, there's no argument about that. The and there's. A, a general agreement, you know, that's been worked out, you know, somewhat laboriously. But I, my, you know, I, I credit the, all of the people who put work into into creating this kind of climate change framework that looks to maintain the rise in global temperature to no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. And we're we're getting there now, and so it's it's the total emissions that determine whether or not we meet that cap. So let's presume that we're serious about meeting that cap. And as I explain, whatever we don't mitigate, we must adapt to. So we, you know we, we can't dodge it either way. We're either dealing with mitigation or adaptation, and that's an important. Un thing to understand because it may be that adaptation, there are adaptation modes that may be more uh, cost effective than some of the mitigation modes. But I think properly the emphasis needs to be on mitigation first. We need to do everything we reasonably can globally to mitigate. But because it's a only the total matters, not T1 plus T2 plus T3 plus T4. It's the sum of all of those. And there are 190 countries that are busy doing this. And so unfortunately, 
there is no alternative but to find some way to get all of the countries that contribute to capital T, the big total, to, to do their share. And the, 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 the tendency to want to free ride, we're all, we're all in the same boat. We'd all love it if everybody else would reduce their emissions. But that doesn't add up. It just won't work. And that's just, and so again, I credit the many, many people uh, that, have, that have put this together. And I think a shining moment in our efforts globally to address climate change was when then President Obama and then President, still President Xi, uh, came to an agreement. And that's why I refer to sort of the importance of this G2, because it's not just that the US and China are the largest emitters. It's the fact that US is representative also of the developing world in this context. And China is representative in many ways, although it's also an anomaly in many ways, of the developing world. And so trying to do negotiation 100, with 190 different parties is madness, right? I mean, you have to do it. At the same time, you can't do it, right? So uh, getting the US and China to agree on, all right, here we understand that as a developing country, uh, you haven't had a chance to sort of uh, go through the stages of economic that we've gone through that led to our high emissions. And it's not, un, it's not totally reasonable for us to say, well, no, you can't emit that. So therefore you can't, you, they can view that, they may view that as a constraint on their economic development potential. And why shouldn't they have the aspiration to develop economically? They should, and they do. And we shouldn't be putting ourselves in the position where we're seen to be thwarting that, yet at the same time, unless they make monumental changes to their developmental trajectories, there's no way globally we can meet this objective, and yet we must. So, so it's imperative that the US and China come to some understanding and mutual accommodation that not only is significant in what they themselves are doing as the two most, uh, as the two major emitters, but also serves as a model for the rest of the world, right? Where China can then go to the rest of the development community and say, look, this is what we've agreed to and this is why, and we need you to come along. And the US can go to the European Union and others and say, this is what we've agreed to and this is why, and we need the rest of you to go along. And of course, US and China, when they're negotiating with each other, right, we should be listening to um, other countries whom we presumably represent in this way, and likewise, China should be doing so. So, and this is true most decidedly in the case of climate change. And that's why I think the appointment, even though in the book I try to stay away from particular personalities and whatnot, but I think this cr creation of a special position uh, filled by a person who has such credibility globally, a former Secretary of State of the United States, for goodness sake, uh, making it the personal mission on behalf of the President of the United States who happens to be Joe Biden at this point, but the fact that the United States would do this sends a strong message that we take this seriously, we're gonna do our part. Uh, I think it's, 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 again, it's a necessary, but not sufficient. So we've got to keep pushing in that direction. But this G2 model also makes sense in other contexts like trade, for example, as I mentioned, we shouldn't be beating China over the head because they don't, they're not in the same position uh, of their economic trajectory as we are, or that they have a different view of what is in their economic interest. Look, we look at our own, what's in our interest. We don't need China to tell us what's in our interest. They're the same way. We need to understand them. I think they need to understand us. I think they understand us at least as well as we understand them. And we should, we should work with that. Again, I see it as necessary, but not sufficient. And we should be proactive in that regard. 
Well, and you highlight uh, climate change and in your chart that you showed at the outset and very much in the book, you highlight uh, that you know carbon dioxide emissions are not a plan. Nobody says, let me emit carbon, but rather it comes about uh, through economic activity. And so, you know, the United States imports a great deal from China. That means that those carbon emissions happened in China. Uh, and the to the extent that there is a cost, it's borne first and foremost by the people of that location. Um, you in your book also identify the movement of, of particulate matter across the oceans and that sort of thing. But also climate change has some implications on the homeland security front, on you know, the foreign affairs front. And that's something, again, in the chart and in the book. Uh, we don't have time to go into everything, but I'd like to close with a focus on that geopolitical section mm. of your book, where you're talking about various threats and you cover a lot of different things. The question of pandemics. You also cover the question of cybersecurity. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about American policy, uh, you know, both uh, who would be responsible for this? Who has uh, been engaged in this? What are the options to address the threat of pandemics, the threat of, you also highlight food security, but also cybersecurity? Yeah, that's, that's, a, big, that's a big, big challenge, um, but it's real, you know, and it's, it, and you know, it was a strange thing about writing this book. Can you just imagine sitting down writing a book on Homeland Security as a pandemic is beginning to rage? I, I felt like a um, someone who's doing an oil portrait of a subject who's busy running around the room, you know, would you please <laughs> sit still for a moment so I could try to capture, capture uh, what's going on. Um, but one of the things that I, Actually, I don't even mention it so much in the book, but it, you know, upon sort of additional reflection and you know, with current events, et cetera, I think that one thing I'm learning is that um, this kind of, not trade policy, but technology policy um, is, is something that we're not, there's no single US federal locus, right? We've got like environmental protection, we've got a treasury, we've got a Department of Homeland Security, which does have a strong mandate for issues around technology, but from a homeland, principally from a homeland security perspective. And then of course there's commerce that has it and primarily from an you know, kind of intellectual capital and uh, intellectual property rights perspective and whatnot. But it's become more apparent to me as a result of this whole exercise that we don't really have a central point, right? What we, what we need just as John Kerry is to climate change, we need someone to be for technology policy. You know, love to get someone like an Elon Musk in there, but he's too busy doing you know, incredibly <laughs> amazing things. But we, we need someone who has that kind of stature in the realm of technology policy who, who can think about the, think about it as a kind of a linchpin in terms of things like jobs, right? The fact that on the one hand, it's creating jobs that are very high productivity jobs in the US while also eliminating or making redundant jobs that are not right, and so how do we how do we address that? That th there's a techno technology dimension to it. The pandemic is is you know raises so many questions about technology from kind of nuts and bolts in terms of logistics and distribution. How do you distribute 
millions of doses of vaccine that need to be kept under certain frozen conditions. It's, it's, it's like a military uh, logistical enterprise, and it is you know, uh, life and death, uh, but also to just the, the hard wiring. I think the, this whole issue of the, you know, where, where technology and AI becomes the actual infrastructure of this sort of next e phase of the global economy that we're, we're entering. And we, we don't really have a specific locus that I'm aware of that where we're, where we're really thinking about that in its full dimensionality. And that's another sort of dotted line that, that uh, we need to pay attention to. And your, your question, I think, points to it. And my lack of an answer is pointing to it as well. Now, well, I think, uh, as you say, you know, there are technology offices scattered throughout the United States government. Uh, you've got science and tech advisors in the White House. You have all of that sort of thing. Uh, but there isn't a single place that you go to uh, to plug holes on cybersecurity or even a single place that you necessarily go to with regard to a public health crisis and things like that. And so the role that technology plays is ever, you know, we're now we're talking about higher technology, but the role that it plays is ever greater. Uh, and so we see that with the Federal Communications Commission, all of these different things. And you talk in, uh, for example, in the book about industrial policy, about infrastructure policy. You note that uh, the East Asia model uh, first in Japan, but also utilized in Taiwan and South Korea, then later in China, about investing, the government investing in particular sectors, protecting markets, things like that. Is it time for the U.S. to do the same? I think so. I think that we need to understand that, that it's, a, it's a fulcrum uh, it's a policy fulcrum that feeds into everything else that we do. And if we don't start at that point uh, and kind of step up to it, um, we're going to miss opportunities. And, you know, that's so evident um, in, in our response to the, the pandemic. And the fact that, you know, again, this has sort of historical origins and this, but you know, we, we have states responsible for so much, uh, but then, uh, and, lo and, and, and even, you know, municipalities, right? Lo local governments responsible for so much, but something like technology and AI is pervasive. And so if we need to, if we need to think about its legal ramifications, its economic ramifications, its trade ramifications, its homeland security ramifications, there are some excellent reports that were done in I cite, including some CRS reports uh, and, and some reports, the quadrennial, one of the quadrennial reports by the uh, Department of Homeland Security does a wonderful job of laying out uh, the, the, this melange of, of actors that are essential to uh, protecting our, our, our security our infrastructure security, our critical infrastructure. But while the report does a wonderful job of outlining all these different parts, it also leaves one a bit aghast that, oh, oh my, is, is who's minding the store? Who's pulling this all together? And again, Homeland Security probably right now is the default option for that. And they need to be there in a big way and they are, but there's so much more to it that Homeland Security, that it's not part of their mandate. It's not part of their mandate to think about industrial strategy, right? If we're not looking to have Huawei providing the global infrastructure for 5G internet, well, who is? And if it's Ericsson and, and some of these others, what are we doing with our partners in Europe and elsewhere to ensure that that 
can happen. Uh, we're not doing enough in my view. Well, Eric, uh, first of all, thank you for this wonderful book. I still have one more question, uh, but there's so much I wanna say to all the people who are part of today's webinar, there is so much more in this book. Uh, and I just wanna encourage people to get it and to dive in because all of these different issues are addressed. Um, many people in the Q&A have uh, actually responded to some of your responses, uh, you know, people lobbying for a chief technology officer, other people asking about Chinese priorities again, uh, about whether or not uh, the experience of being in the United States uh, actually makes a positive impression on those Chinese students. We have a bunch of questions. I'm sorry that we can't address them all. But in the two or three minutes that we have remaining, I'd like to ask you this question. You've been looking for quite some time at the US government, at how the uh, various agencies, uh, the, the different groups that have certain responsibility, as well as looking at interest groups and things like that. You haven't focused on the politics of these, of these questions, but rather on the policy, that sort of thing. So you understand the US government, particularly in how it is struggling to cope with this. Also in the climate section, you discuss the role of subnational units, states, uh, cities, and things like that. Uh, something that you know is really very important. There are a lot of actors in this game. So let me ask this final question, which is, do we know enough? Do we have the expertise needed to fully grasp the changes that are going forward in China and what those might mean for the United States? Where are we strong? Where are we weak? I think we never know enough. I mean, you know, those of us who live in universities, I mean, that's why we love to be here. We never know enough and there's always so much more to learn. And so, uh, but that's, you know, that's what we love to do. So, but we, we can't learn everything. So we need to be sort of strategic in terms of where we, we focus. And really it, it comes full circle in a way, it comes back to, it's made me think a lot about the nature of democracy. Also, what's been happening over recent over recent years, uh, right here at home uh, in the United States, has made me think, you know, reflect a lot about the nature of democracy. And but I've felt this long a long time, you know, for decades. You know, as long as I've been in this line of work, it really does come back to full circle. In a democracy, the good news and the bad news is that we, the people, bear ultimate responsibility. And so it's our obligation to be well-informed and no, we'll never know enough. But you know, one of the things I learned when I was a PhD student and I was shaking in my boots, you know, thinking about taking the qualifying exams that one needed to, to pass in order to, to move on in the program. And you know, our department had a really, <laughs> You know, terrifying cut rate, you know? So I thought, oh gracious, how am I gonna do this? And I remember for a while, I, I was trying so hard to read everything. If I saw an article, oh, I haven't read that one yet. Oh my God, what's gonna happen to me? And I had to go and read this article. In the end, I, I realized you'll never keep up with it, you know? And what, what you need to do is, what we all need to do is we need to learn the fundamentals reasonably well. And if we understand the fundamentals reasonably well, then it's reasonably likely we won't be fundamentally wrong <laughs> in our policy things. And I think if we do, if we were to do that, and I don't believe that we do right now, quite frankly, uh, if we were to do that, I think it would take us a significant step ahead. And that's, that's a pragmatic view and it's fun to learn. 
Uh, it absolutely is fun to learn. And I have learned quite a lot from today's session. I've learned so much uh, from the book that I keep waving at our audience, because I think that it is really rich. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean it's so thick with detail that you can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, you really do a great job of illuminating some of these big issues and different ways of approaching them. It really is a look at China, not so much, you know, from certainly not from a Chinese perspective, and not so much focusing on what China is and what it can be, but on what the United States, uh, how the United States is being affected by China's rise. It's a terrific book, and I really hope our audience goes out and gets it. Uh, we've only scratched the surface, but I want to say thank you, Professor Hecula, for doing the work to create this book and sharing some of it with us today. Thank you, Dr. Duby. I appreciate your kind words, and thank you, everyone.